Hello everybody, this is Taco Movie Talks, and we are here with, I believe, week 18. Uh, it's been a hectic week for both Matt and I, and I am alluding to the guest that I have with me. It is Matthew, a.k.a. Warchamp, on Letterbox. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for liking. Thank you for having me. And thank you for subscribing. And yeah, thank you, Matt, for being here. I really appreciate you joining me for this discussion on the one, the only, Terrence Malick. And uh, we had a really good conversation going right before we started recording. And you were telling me a lot about him because he's a very well-known director in certain in a certain sense and then kind of an unknown in uh, another sense, for sure, like from what you were telling me. Yeah, um, I'll just, I guess, I'll, I'll kind of repeat, you know, what I was talking about. So Malik grew up, you know, so I'm from Texas, and he grew up in uh, Austin, and I think in Oklahoma, too. And then down in Texas, a lot of people have oil money, and that usually means they're extremely rich. And I believe his family struck oil money early, and uh, like early in his life, and so... He, he became pretty privileged, um, and then he attended Harvard, and he studied philosophy, and then he went on to go to Oxford, and he was going to do a PhD in philosophy, but he dropped out, he quit over a disagreement, and then he went and taught philosophy uh, as a professor at MIT, and then after he quit that, he kind of, I guess, found his calling in cinema, and he started uh, off with his movie Badlands. So his his movies always come from a place of um, the philosophy he was interested in, which were postmodernists like uh, Kierkegaard and Heidegger. And there, uh, it would take it could take me hours to explain how they changed this kind of philosophy, like the scope of philosophy in general. But we're here to discuss the movies, not philosophy. So. Um, but yeah, but, but he's a huge philosophy subscriber or subscriber to the postmodernist notion, I should say. And it's very apparent in his films, if you're familiar with that, uh, that kind of philosophy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't have that deep of a background, but like you said, it's, it's definitely evident in his films and it seems like a lot of his characters are directly driven by a certain outlook that they kind of have on life or their circumstances. So like you said, it does play a tremendous role in his films. And I think it makes it interesting and unique in that way. Yeah. Um, one thing I love about his characters is, you know, he, sh he the way he does characters is very different. It's not like, character development or you know character goes through a story and achieves something defeats someone conquers something new it's just he's kind of an observer of you know as you've seen you know his movies are kind of they all have voiceovers so you're, you're kind of getting the internal you know voice of the character with this backdrop of nature so he's always um, incorporating nature with the characters and the characters aren't it, it's more about their their internal struggle and then the way he can get that across like I said is through his voiceovers that he implements in every movie if I'm mist not mistaken I think it's a really you know good use of that type of storytelling I like the narr like the narration for sure because as you were saying, it gives you a deeper connection to the character and you really get to understand who they are. Um, uh -huh. You could, you could, I could see perhaps some people disliking it, but I think the way it's done, it's done well. And it kind of gives you a greater appreciation of the movies. And even in the, the trailer for another Terrence Malick movie that we didn't cover this week, I think it was Knight of Cups, like uh -huh. Christian Bale narrating in that trailer. It seems like so epic and kind of like it drives you to want to watch it and it kind of sucks you in 
to whatever universe his movie is kind of taking place in. All based in reality, but you get, like, shades of life that you wouldn't normally get to see. Yeah, the the thing about all his movies is they, they literally, like, put me in a trance. Mm. And I've, like, like, to where, like, I know I say, like, you know, you know, the best movies are where my eyes are always glued to the screen. Typically, that's the best movie. But, like, his, uh, I get put in this, you know, kind of philosophical trance in the same way as when I was, disco- you know, reading a lot of philosophy and kind of discovering my own outlook on life. Um, his his movies are kind of, in my play, it, it, this is maybe a weird, like, uh, you know, comparison, but they're kind of like, going to church, you know, I grew up going to church. I, I don't go as much anymore or really anymore, but I grew up going to church a lot and there's, you can get a kind of spiritual experience sometimes. And I get that same exact spiritual experience, like the same exact same kind of thing when I'm watching a lot of his films, it can kind of, you know, with, it, it's just this kind of greater than life feeling. And, um, I, I don't know if it's, you know, trying to break down his his style is super hard because I don't know a lot of the specifics, but like just the way he pairs the cinematography with his montage style editing with the voiceovers um, just is, you know, all that combined together is, is spiritual for me is the best way to, to put it. Yeah, it's like you said what I think is one of his strengths and something I really appreciate in directors is that he can almost get a sense of this type of person, whether what character he's writing, it feels like it comes from like he had someone who he based it off of and it's like fully fleshed out. I really, yeah. really liked that. It was yeah, super evident in Badlands. Um, it's also evident in Thin Red Line. Those are the two movies we're covering. But, like, mm-hmm. in Badlands, it, it really, really felt like you were with those two characters, uh, the two leads. And it was... It was almost eerie, like how realistic I felt the depiction was in a sense. Yeah, and and it's, I think it's because, you know, throughout the movie, he, you know, there's not a lot of establishing shots. For example, like um, shots that kind of show where they are. It's just kind of like the, the, he, at least in Badlands, this is, you know, Badlands is a lot different than his other films. Um, it's It has a, more of a plot than pretty much all the others um and a narrative but um like for example it's always like the cameras on the characters or it's on the characters in a huge wide lens with this big you know the badlands of montana like these open beautiful shots of the sun uh, just sprawling over um and i think that yes i think that he took his personal you know maybe some personal people he knew or um, things uh, that he'd seen, as well as concepts. I mean, this was before, you know, school shootings were a thing, but Mm -hmm. this kind of thing, you know, there was the movie Bonnie and Clyde. That was something that actually happened. I think that, you know, these two characters can can kind not get exchanged for, but are very similar to someone like the two Columbine shooters or Bonnie and Clyde in a sense that they that he shows how, you know, he, the camera, as I said, or he's like an observer. He's just watching them, this, this like, sense of, uh, there's a French term for it. It's like, fou de do or something. It's like when uh, two people do something, uh, you know, crazy together, it just gets crazier. Yeah. Um, you know that you know that term? I have, and, and, yes. Yeah, and that's, I feel that, you know, in this in this movie um that that sense of you know you know a lot of times teenage angst i guess is the best way to describe it yeah i i uh i think that's a a great kind of starting point talking about badlands 
because it kind of, I'm glad you touched on two things and like how, like you said, it was more or less before like school shootings had become such a sensationalized part of our everyday lives. It was kind of, we're on the run together. Um, it's us against the world kind of trying to run from authority and there is you know it exhibits some of the personality styles it has that similar relationship where there's like a clear kind of leader and then someone who is pretty much just entranced by the you know the, the stronger force so this movie in in kind of illustrating that was really neat to kind of look through a modern day lens. And, and I'm yeah. glad that you brought that up. Yeah. And, and one thing I want to say that I really like about this, about that aspect and about what he does with it is that, you know, today and, you know, for a long time, people always try and, you know, label, put reasons on why these things happen, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's because guns, you know, it's because, well, yeah, it's because a combination of factors, you know, it's because of a lot of things, but this movie, you know, I, I love the movie or I like really like the movie natural born killers. You know, it's also a similar movie. They go around killing people, but in that movie, um, there's a lot of flashbacks to each character's childhood and you see how they were like abused horribly. And so, you kind of get this sense that, oh, they're natural born killers because, you know, they were raised in, in this environment where, um, <laughs> you know, that's what they all they knew. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, you don't see that here. You, there's, there's, you just see like this, you know, that this Kit Kits or uh, Marjean um, become this manipulative 25 year old lost violent guy just happen to take advantage of this 15 year old and they just go on a killing spree. And it's like the camera's just kind of there to show, you know, what happened without, without trying to imply this is why it happened. And I really like that because I really like movies and, and, you know, this particular movie saying, you know, that this isn't, this isn't something that can be answered by just one thing. There's a, a lot of things leading up to to the, these shootings, you know, but it just that's left up to the viewer to decide. And I think I just personally like that more. <laughs> Me too. I I think you, they're not trying to explain it away. In a certain sense, I think on like an initial viewing, something like Natural Born Killers would be maybe scarier to think that. Uh, there's people who are being raised in a certain way that's going to make them evil. But I think if you were to like kind of reflect on a movie like Badlands, really look at it and dissect it, that is maybe the scarier thing because there isn't necessarily a rhyme or a reason. And the way that this film kind of... T- it almost takes a non-judgmental approach. It's just this is the fact of the matter. And this, you know, it, it's feels truer to reality than perhaps something that almost romanticizes or glorifies certain aspects of life and points it out as like this equals this you you know what i'm trying to say yeah exactly um and i know and it's interesting that this was based off uh, uh an actual shooting that happened in montana and i think or in the badlands and i think uh the the real guy was sort of similar to this guy this guy's kind of like a like a james dean figure you know but he's kind of just got nothing but going for him um but he's got that look you know with the the denim and the the hair um but but it's just yeah it, i would say this is you know the scenes in natural War killers are definitely scary when they're getting abused but overall you know this is more scary because you see a 15 year old girl, you know, just playing in their neighborhood, doing what kids did in the fifties, the late fifties. Um, and, and then this just starts happening and you're like, this girl just got caught up in this killing spree. And now she doesn't really have a way to get out. And 
she's kind of liking it in a way, I think, you know, you're like, I think she's, she's enjoying this, but is she, or is she just enjoying the, the, you know, the ride, like wanting to go on for the ride? Does she, is she just have a boring life and like, this is exciting and this is some kind of, you know, teen, like teens wanting to be free, but now it's gone too far. And, you know, after, uh, he kills her dad, she might be like, okay, well, this is the lost cause. I'm trying to <laughs> go in. The, uh, I'm in her. I'm going to the police or I'm going with him. But it's like going with him is more exciting. And she sees him as this like larger than life figure and him being a manipulator. He could see that, you know, so he takes advantage of that. Um, but it's just interesting that to me, you know, a shooter is interested in taking someone along like this with them. And I think, I thought it was super interesting how many scenes were just them kind of hanging out like while they're on the run. It's kind of like you always wonder like when you see, uh, you know, two killers went on a spree and now they're on the run like um, happened in Canada, I believe, a couple years ago. And those two guys went on the run in the uh, mountains and they ended up, I think, dead. I, I don't remember. It was, it was it was one of those true crime things. And uh but you kind of wonder, you know, what are they doing when they're on the run? Mm -hmm. And this and this movie kind of shows a lot of that. And it's very interesting to see. And I think that might actually, if it's a girl and a guy at least, you know, it, it could be a little true. And it's interesting to, to watch. So, I agree, yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, the way that we would maybe envision prison where you think it's like constant action. There's just stuff going on every minute. But the uh -huh. people inside, they kind of say it's like 95% downtime and then 5% like just insanity and chaos. And uh, right. I feel like Malik kind of perfectly captured that where it's like being on the run. It's like you're just kind of hunkered down. You're driving aimlessly. You know, you're, you're looking at a map trying to figure out where the hell you are because you're not on a road. And, uh, and then – you might run into someone and that's when stuff just completely pops off. Um, right, right. Yeah. So th just, and there's some, there's a lot of subtlety to it too, where um, kind of going back to where they didn't do flashbacks to like tell you the whole story of their lives, but you get a really good sense of kind of where they're at in their station of life just through mm -hmm. through interactions with bosses and their parents and it like it's just that combination of meeting someone at the right time wrong place wrong time i guess um can lead to this type of relationship where you can kind of feed off of one another but i want to ask you cuz you kind of brought up a good question why do you think Kit wanted to have someone there with him? You know, <laughs> um, you know, I don't want to be like a, I'm, I don't have a psychology. I don't want to try and psycho like analyze his him, but I'll, but you know, he's definitely lonely. You know, when you think about his character. He just got like, fired from a job as a trash guy. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, what's he going to do now? Um, and, and he seems to me like the type of person that, uh, maybe uh, you would say they peaked in high school or whatever, you know, that kind of cliche. Mm -hmm. And he's still living in that town and now he's 25 and, you know, maybe all his friends have moved away and he's definitely a loner. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to find a 15 year old to hang out with and, you don't really have any other friends except the 15 year old girl who's still in high school and you're my age, you know, out of college, uh, you're probably a lonely person. And I think that, um, I, I don't know if he would have, you know, it's such an interesting question because you don't know if he would have killed without meeting her because her dad was the first one to die. Mm -hmm. So you don't know, maybe he had been searching for someone his whole life or up until the age 25, you know, and hadn't really found someone to relate to. 
And now, you know, he found this vulnerable young girl who thinks everything he does is cool. And so he's like, oh, well, this is awesome. You know, someone lo- like loves me, you know, they, they, and he might not have had experiences like that before, which is sad, but it's true for a lot of people. But they don't show him having like that violent upbringing, but you get that whole sense, like you were just saying, um, you know, from from what the movie shows. You and and the the best part about it is Malik, Malik the way uh, Malik edits and films is that he lets you connect those dots. You know, because mm-hmm. it's not it's not films and all his movies are like this. They're uh, it's like a the way they you know like if you're building a Lego set. Um, except Lego sets have to be built one way, <laughs> but in this in this case, say they can be built a plethora of different ways. You know, he's building his scenes in like this montage style. If, if you're familiar with Eisenstein, one of the first to do it, where um, instead of kind of showing the viewer and connecting the dots for them, uh, a scene might cut to some. He, he does this a lot. You know, it'll cut to just the nature shot. Mm -hmm. And then it'll cut back to something else. And you're supposed to kind of, as the viewer, or at least what I think, is you kind of sit there and and in your mind you put the pieces together. You build the blocks yourself. And I think, and I get much more of a rewarding experience, I would say, out of that than I do movies that just straight up tell me. Not to say that those are bad. It's just a different way to construct the film. Exactly. Um I mean, there's a real common saying, show, don't tell, you know, when it comes to yeah. any form of media. And like you said, it's more rewarding that way. Um, and I, 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 I'm trying to think of the, the phrase, but it's almost like choosing such a young woman kind of shows the immaturity of Kit in a way. It's almost mm-hmm. as though he never progressed past that point, and that's like his his comfort level is being around people that maybe actually that put him on a pedestal. Uh, the, the reason I asked you to kind of like why you thought she was with him. Cause uh, you know, I, I had a few people who were watching the movie with me and they asked like, you know, not, they weren't paying as much attention. They were kind of just tuning in and out and they get to yeah. the point where after he killed, like, why, why, why is she with this guy? And like, why does he want her around to me? And I think it kind of agrees with what you had said too. I think he was in love with the idea of having someone in love with him. Yes. Yes, exactly. And that is probably somewhat common, um, with any type of killer really is that there's a hole that they feel like never was really satisfied growing up that they then try to um, fill through. And, and with his case, I don't know if the killing was necessarily like the thrill or the goal. I, I honestly think it became the only way to keep this relationship going do you yeah yeah oh sorry no 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 i was just about to ask if you if you agreed with that yeah i mean it's it's well that's definitely true it was the only way to keep it going and but for from you know just my perspective it just starts to spiral like for me like uh there's the scene where they encountered those guys uh that they didn't expect to i think at the house and i didn't think they were going to kill him you know and because they didn't they weren't really like that suspicious of them they weren't like oh y'all are the killers um i forget you know who it is or which scene it is but you know Marge she or a kid just takes out his gun and just shoots him and i'm like holy shit you know like I didn't just didn't expect it. And it, and it turns in, I think to this thing where he starts to think I got to kill everyone that we run into, mm-hmm. you know, cause everyone knows. And that's a common thing just with, you know, killers in general, um, telling everyone who, who could have seen them or could have known what they were doing. But at the same time, I think, you know, 
they were both subconsciously aware that they were going to be caught eventually. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same with anyone who goes on the run in real life. And I think maybe it's this kind of adrenaline um, packed like high. I think it's a high, honestly, Mm -hmm. that these guys that that they're getting going on the run, you know, because because like when you pump with adrenaline in any situation, it's 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 a high but it's you know it's it's you just feel weird but Mm -hmm. i think going on the run i can't even imagine the type of you know anxiety mixed with adrenaline mixed with paranoia i mean and i think it just culminates after you've killed enough people it's just like we got to keep killing people at this point (laughs) like we we, like they didn't really have it it, a plan i think they just kind of just started to just do whatever you know hang out in the trees yeah you know uh you know just what what like like the trailer kind of says you know they just went around badlands killing people that's kind of what just what ha- what ends up happening and i don't know if there's a rhyme or reason to it and i think malik wants us to to question that to to you know i think he wants us to to dive deeper into that question why but I don't think there's a direct answer, which is the, the whole thing about all of Malick's movies. <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. I would imagine it would feel surreal. And I think a lot of people can relate and have felt that, that feeling you're describing where it's, it's almost too intense to like full you. It seems like things are almost going in like, the speed of life has changed. You're not sure. Like you can't really pick up on words the same way. Like you feel like you're almost in a different plane just because of how intense the situation is. And it leads to kind of uh, a conclusion in the minds of the characters where I think, like you said, both, knew, you know, as time went on, that they were going to be caught and they they wanted to almost do it on their own terms, you know, where, where yeah. it seemed like Kit was a, more thinking about making the most of the, the infamy that he had kind of um, created for himself and then you know, the, the 15 year old, I think was like, I would like to live a life (laughs) away from this moving forward. Um, yeah. I, and I, I think that's the most logical and, and the best way to kind of end it. it. It might seem confusing, like as it's happening, how both they, they almost just retreat and surrender but it does make uh, a lot of sense kind of looking back at it. Yeah, yeah, I think they they want to go out with a bang and, and maybe, you know, his kid's intention after he starts it is to just keep going until he dies. You know, a lot of those people are also extremely suicidal usually mm-hmm. and they end up wanting to die at the end or they just kill themselves. Um, or they try and die by, you know, shooting at the poli- like police shooting them um which is a common thing for like the mass you know spree shooters like this um but it, it's uh, another a thing i found interesting was that it never seems like the girl's manipulated even though she is but it's because you're getting her perspective you know mm-hmm. and i think that's very interesting because you know you're, you're getting this young girl's take And to her, it just seems kind of like this fun adventure because she's 15, Mm -hmm. you know, and she doesn't, I mean, she understands that killing people's wrong, but I don't think she, she quite grasps the consequences. Whereas him as a 25 year old does. And, you know, so, you know, 10 years later for her in real life, she probably looks back and, and, and is very remorseful and, and thinks, and she probably thinks of it like, like this weird, like, um, 
I, like like you would think of a near death experience. Like very, like you can. It's very vivid, easy to remember, but it's also uh, hard because you don't want to remember it because it's so brutal. Um, I think you know it, it's. Yeah, I, I think the. I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is the perspective, once again, voiceover from the 15-year-old says a lot about um, both, I guess, the intent of both parties, you know, as they go on their spree. Yeah. I, it, you know, you brought up good points again. It's like I can't imagine a life after that. Like as a 15-year-old mm-hmm. to have been a part of that is – yeah, it, it like life would just feel so weird just <laughs> having known that that's an experience that you've gone through and and envisioning that and like you know yeah I traveled across the country with probably the most wanted man in America at one point in time and then just <laughs> let let you know I have a family now and I'm making dinner but the thing with Kit where he basically he could get away and then he decides to pull over shoot his tire out and then leave stones like this is where you caught me and then just willfully submit to the police and then to see the way like these police people are like oh do you want my like he's giving his comb away he's giving his lighter away like just it's like this is the 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 best i can get from here i would rather be famous in jail in fry than like continue on the run by myself i think was a huge part of it as well it was just it was kind of shocking because it's like he seemed like he had you know, a light at the end of the, or an out at least for that day. And instead he takes it upon himself to end the journey there. And it was, it was pretty, pretty insane, honestly. And I know it's based on a true story and that's what makes it all the, the crazier, you know? Yeah. You know, that doesn't usually happen. Um, I, it's impossible to predict what's going on in the mind of someone who does that especially at the end of the three, you know, because like you said, I mean, you look at Colin Vine, um, I guess there are, I guess it's maybe split 50, 50 where people will just kind of give up afterwards. And then people who will, you, like you said, take their own lives or, you know, end trying to take on an insurmountable force of like, you know, dozens and dozens of police officers um, mm-hmm. so it's, I think some, go ahead. I, was just gonna, I, I think some people want to live notoriously in prison. And I think some want to die as, as, as self-perceived murders. You know what I'm saying? I, uh, yes, I, I see what you're, you're saying there. And did you kind of like, um, how he also had, uh, a unique set of morals that he explained to, to the, the girl, I can't remember the actress's name. She plays Carrie. Uh, that yeah, that's... I don't, I don't, I don't remember her name. Um, wait, can you remind me of like that scene? Um, where where he's talking about like his morals? You mean? Yeah. Okay, so they're they're in the their tree house set up, uh-huh. and he had killed the bounty hunters by using underground tunnels and kind of like sneaking up on them and shooting them as they weren't suspected. And then we get a narration where the girl said that he didn't feel bad about shooting them in the back because they were only in it for the money. Whereas had it been police officers, he wouldn't have, he would have gave them a fair shake because they were just doing their job. Yeah. You know, I mean, this from just personally, like, like studying a lot of true crime cases, um, there's a lot of weird moral constructs that these killers have just like, you know, they'll, and they also will do stuff like they'll decide to spare someone their life, 
Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it is playing God. And I think a lot of it, you know, if you if, if we're talking about, you know, this kind of thing, it's, it's, it, he's like, in a way trying to be like, you know, this is my world. Um, so I'm going to set the rules here. You know, I see these guys as a little more, I see these cops as a little more, you know, um, I don't know, not righteous, but, oh, they're just doing their jobs. Um, it doesn't make any sense that that moral view mm-hmm. because the cops are getting paid as they're doing their jobs. You <laughs> exactly. know, they're getting money too. But the way he spins it is just this very, it just, I guess, goes to show even more of his odd perspective on things. Like, like some people deserve to die and some people don't, you know, and that's the same thing that, you know, you find a lot of like the, like the Columbine shooters, like the journals of Eric Harris, you know, you find all these things about who deserves to die, natural selection, you know, this person deserves to die because X, well, you know, we can let these people live. You know, it's this weird, like, viewpoint that a lot of killers like him have. And, and I mean, it's obviously irrational, but it's just, I wonder too what makes them think those things you know because like why like bounty hunters are you know they're there to get you just like the police you know what do you think (laughs) it's a good point yeah it's because it it is there's kind of a clear um hole in his logic there like you said and he let the the rich person and the maid live as well while he like basically had those two people who showed up to the house. He had them like in a bunker to where they could have probably easily got away, but then he shoots through the door afterwards. It's like part of me thinks he's trying to take back control. Like you said, he wants it to almost like create a world that he has some sense of power over maybe because he didn't for so long, you know, like his life wasn't going well to this point. And it was like finally having someone who was trying to dictate who he could see a 15 year old girl and didn't want anything to do with him kind of set him up to where he's like, I'm going to control my narrative through violent means, unfortunately, but it doesn't make sense. There really isn't. It's, it's all circumstantial. It seems like it would make almost more sense if he just killed everyone. But the fact that he doesn't kind of creates these odd logical fallacies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's this very strange, and and at, like like we were discussing earlier, we don't really know where it comes from. We don't really know his childhood, but not taking that into account, just you know, as a person, it feels like he's developed this weird complex. And you know, maybe since he's twenty five, it's been bubbling up for a long time. And you know, people like him, you know, a lot of the times, and you know, at least in Western society, we just like to be like, he was a psychopath. I don't mm-hmm. you don't really need to say anything else. That's that, you know? Like people love to do that stuff. Yeah. Um they'll be like he's a psychopath, so he did it because he like physically cannot feel, you know, all like down the DSM checklist and all that. But I think there's just more to it and I think, you know, the movie does a good job of showing that. There's so much more variables at play than just um, you know, these check marks in the list, you know, like yeah, they could have had a bad childhood, he could have also not. He could have been popular at school, and then all his friends left him. He could have been a loner. And he's never had friends, and now he he wants a sense of control. There's so many, you know, different paths to the to the explanation of why, and and I think this is just Malik's kind of first way that he's touching on a bigger concept, which is, you know, why do what leads to something like this in a person. Um, you know, not just like through their experience, but, but what is it about 
you know, their, where they live, everything, you know, their compl- like how they were made up, where they went to school, um, all, like everything about a human being. There's, it's more than just labels, you know, Th- their mood at the time, you know, their location. He could have, he might have never met the 15 year old if he wasn't, you know, driving by when she was playing in the street. There's just so many factors that go into it that you can't just be like, he did this because of X. And I think that what Malik does, or what Malik does really well is, show, is, is make you question more than make you answer about at least a lot about Kit. You know, you question, what the hell is this guy doing, you know, throughout a lot of the film? What's his motivation? And it's never, it's, it's never told to you because I, I don't even think the real guy could explain it, you know, like the, 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 the real life murder. I think if you asked him, he'd probably just give you some answer. Like, I don't know. He'd make something up. He might lie. He might just say, I regret it, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's one of those, those conceptual things, um, that, that when you ask people that do, you know, outrageous acts like this, why they did it, yeah, that's the that's the whole question, you know. Why'd you do it? You know, there's there's usually never a sensible answer, like a reasonable answer. And that it's, I think it's been a like a fascination of society, even dating back to to seventy three, and it still permeates through our society where true crime is just as popular, if not more so, than it's ever been, and we are completely. I don't know if infatuated is the right word, but we want to know why. So we all we love looking at these in great detail with fine tooth comb and just try to get some semblance of an answer. So to pick up on that and kind of display it and illustrate it so well for, I believe this is Malik's debut. Am I correct in that? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. It's very impressive, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, for a for a debut film, it, it you can tell it's his debut it, once you've seen his others. But when I re- went back and watched it, I liked it more. Uh, like I got to get to the first time, I think I gave like a seven or eight, and I went back and rewatched it, and I liked it more after seeing his other films because I got more from the different thing shots he does. So I was like, okay, you know, he's I see what he's doing here now because he develops it more in his later films. So that's another interesting part about this movie in particular. What uh, what would you rate this and, and any final thoughts that you'd want to give on Badlands by Terrence Malick from 1973? Yeah, so I would give this one a... Uh, let's have a, what I had written. One second. Uh-huh. Uh, can you repeat oh. that? Yeah. Uh, I said I think I... I did. I gave this a nine out of ten. Um, it's not my favorite Malik movie. It's a one of the most impressive debuts. I think maybe one with Michael. Um, and yeah, I mean, any other thoughts? This is definitely it, if you want to watch a Malik film that has a decent narrative structure and plot, um, watch this movie and also watch this movie. Well, you didn't watch this movie before you watched another Malick film, but I would highly suggest to watch this as your first Malick film if you've never seen a film by him before. Because it's just, there is a story, there is a narrative. Um, And in the other films, there is, but as he goes on and on, there's less and less of one. So if you're not used to him, he's harder and harder to follow or get something out of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I find this is very common after talking about the films with, with someone else when like recording, um, my appreciation grows and I feel like I like this film even more after talking to you about it. So first of all, regardless, I would have highly recommended, I even strongly stronger recommendation now. Um, I gave it a seven out of 10. I do think it's something that I would want to rewatch because kind of when you look at it through the lens that I think we examined it from, it makes it 
even more. It draws you in. It a it leads you to ask questions and try to look for fine details to to kind of figure out motivations and whatnot. But it was it was really great. And I like Charlie Sheen, not Charlie Sheen, Martin Sheen, uh, absolutely dominated this role. As oh yeah, I think this was his breakout too. I mean, uh, I think this was his breakout role. Yeah, he did great. He was top tier. And looking at it from a character study perspective, it's it's really really good. Um, yeah, I know. Even though I don't think he intended it to be like a character study, it basically is a a very good one. You know. Yes. Um, yeah. Moving into a later film from Terrence Malick, we have Thin Red Line. Uh, first and foremost, absolutely star studded cast. And it's kind of a critique on the motivations and the actions taken, uh, from this large unit that is trying to advance into Japanese territory. Um, uh -huh. that's about the, the, I think a, a good overarching summary, but we get multiple perspectives about what's going on. Um, but for me, just out of the gates, two things that I think you, you can't gloss over, we have to go into is the fact that, like I said, this cast is just overwhelmingly uh, high profile. And secondly kind of tie in with point one is how I didn't even know this until you sent me a clip Adrian Brody who I believe has won an Oscar for best actor set to be yeah. the lead of this and then only has maybe two lines of dialogue yep and then you'll notice that uh, all the other A-listers at the time like Woody Harrelson has about five to ten minutes of uh of dial of voiceover um all the a-listers actually i actually looked into this before we did this podcast because i wanted to see it all like the biggest names at the time i mean you got george clooney you got john c Riley. i mean the the biggest a-listers had about two to three minutes of time of camera time i mean it was mostly actually the lesser known actors like the one that played wit um, and, uh, I, I forget the character's names in his movies. Cause to me, it's not usually about, I don't know. Um, but like Sean Penn, you know, it's got a lot of time, but there's so many A-listers, but what he did was he filmed out of sequence and he filmed so much footage and he basically created the movie in the editing room, which is very, you know, um, a different approach. So... I'm sure there's a ton of, you know, footage that we've just never seen of dialogue with all these actors, but he just didn't include it, you know? So he gives, so while it's a star studded cast, it actually came out the same year as private saving private Ryan, but I don't think it could be any, uh, a more different film than saving private Ryan. Um, and it's studded with this cast that you barely even, see. <laughs> um, but yeah, but what do you think about, about that? Or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, like you said, the the guy who played Wit, I'm like, uh -huh. he got so much screen time. Like you said, it's yep. like you have, it's it was as though the A listers were like extras, a, a large yes. period. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of, it makes you wonder why Malik decided to go in that direction. Um, but it's, it's just kind of mind blowing. Cause like you said, like John Travolta is in this. You yeah. Know, he, yeah. He gets two minutes. He's in there for about two minutes. Yeah. John Travolta is. <laughs> you see yeah. him at the beginning and I'm like, okay, so he's going to be a large part of the story. Never see him again. Uh, <laughs> you said Clooney. You're like, okay. So you, I kept waiting. I'm like, when is he going to be in it? <laughs> Get to the end. He is like at the nearly the very end of the movie. Um, yeah. But he's a very I, I from what I 
was able to absorb from that interview you sent. Malik is very hands-on when it comes to shooting, um, writing, and editing as well. So I think Mm -hmm. he basically, like you said, handcrafted something after they had shot, which I don't, I, I can't really even grasp how you would go about doing that. It gives me a headache even trying to... Oh, sorry, finish. You're going to say, I was just going to respond to it. Just, I don't know how the hell you would be able to kind of do that, you know? Dude, for me, it's actually funny because, like, when I think of, you know, because I think I eventually want to make a film or try, I think I want to make it exactly like how that how he does. Like, the way I think about filmmaking, I think it about it in that way. Like, I film stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I film a lot of things, you know, just an assortment of things that I, I find intriguing. And I think that's what he does. Like he's known for doing things like uh, crew members talked about, he would climb up in a tree and he'd be like, there's this bird over here, get the cameras on the bird. And then like, you know, they're filming the bird for a while. And then that's one of the little uh, cutaway shots of the movie would be like the hawk will be like a hawk flying from its tree or something. You know, there's so many nature shots. It opens up with the crocodile. Mm. Um, in, in that Tarkovsky esque way, do you know what I'm saying? Where he uses it as he uses nature as transitional um, visuals. Um, it's like yeah. it's telling a part of the story. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, but I the what I wanted to like say about this movie overall is that this is a to me, this is a poetic movie. A lot of people say, you know, Malik does poetry movies. This is a poetic movie for me. Um, in my opinion, this is a movie that is extremely philosophical. It's a war movie, but not really. It's more about a meditation to me. It's more about a meditation and a contemplation of life, death, uh, nature, and um, the internal or I'm going to use a a philosophy word, a priori, um, which just means basically inherent um, Mm -hmm. in a sense, but they use that more for like uh, uh, more for the mind, like what's, what's already in the mind as you're born. Um, What's this sense of, of, you know, that's the opening line of the movie. What I I believe he says something, or it's Woody Harrelson or one of the characters says, you know, what's this fire of nature always, you know, um, fighting against each other. And it, and, it, and it's talking about not only nature itself, you know, animals, other animals besides humans, but it's talking about human beings. You know, why are we fighting each other? Why do we go to war? What's this? Why? You know, and, and it's, an, it's these big, big metaphysical questions um, that are posed in, in my mind in this film. And just to say one more thing about the A-listers, is that I think they're just in there and they're, they're extras in a way, maybe because he wants, he doesn't want us to focus on them, you know, because a lot mm. of the times, you know, if George Clooney or Woody Harrelson in a movie, they're the person, they're the, the, they're like running the movie and the movie's really good because of their acting. You know, there's a lot of movies like that uh, where the character kind of, or where an actor will carry a film. And I think he wanted to maybe deviate a little way from that, a little bit from that, and kind of make this more about the the thematic overall big picture question. Um, even though there are some character stories in here, you know, like Wall and and or, or like the different soldiers, and maybe he wanted to make the the lesser known actors or the seem like they might seem more like the normal soldiers instead of the A list actors who might seem like, you know, the higher ranking so soldiers because we know them better or some, some something of the sort. Yeah, that's it's almost like a meta esque way to make the film. Like you said, like the, the people in power are well known. They almost have a gravitas to them because of what they had done prior. We lend them this trust because, you know, we've seen them in XYZ. I really like that thought and to kind of take it out of the hands of like, is there certain actors where you can't quite 
um, they're not the character anymore. It's like, that's Tom Cruise now, you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, definitely. You know, like Tom Cruise and, um, oh, what's up those movies? I've seen one or two of them. Mission Impossible. Like yeah. Mission Impossible. Like Tom, like you just, like he's his character, but you know, Tom Cruise is going to be Tom Cruise in that movie. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. and it, it tells so much. The, the breadth of what it goes for, like you said, these are kind of existential questions. Why do we fight? And it kind of warrants this huge story that at first seems like it's just, okay, we need to get to the top of the hill. And then it keeps going and going because that is needed. It's essential to really tell the full complex nature of this philosophical question. Like, why do we fight um, despite all of these things? And, and the way he does touch on a lot of different characters. I mean, we have wit who we cover very closely because I think his arc kind of brings us a lot of different perspectives and can help, kind of help guide us through very important parts of it. To be able to touch uh-huh. on these different characters gives us really unique perspectives too as to what these outcomes can can turn us into. Um, and in, in yeah. that way, it's amazing. Yeah, with him being this you know AWOL soldier at the beginning, and I think that those are some of the most beautiful moments of the movie is him being with the the native people you know, uh, uh, that part you know him interacting with them playing with them he's one he's part of their community and i think malik thinks that's the most beautiful way that humans and nature you know there's the the whole thing where you know people who will take like psychedelics will say like stuff like oh i felt you know i was one with nature and things like that and i that kind of like point that's like the cliche type of saying is i think what he's trying to get across initially is that they are one with nature um like personally i when i studied abroad i i got to go to fiji for cheap and i got to actually spend a lot of time with the natives there and they they act very similar to the movie and it's an incredible experience you know seeing how that you know they go out and they spear fish at night and they bring the fish back in they all eat together you know this is this very communal way of living and it's one with nature you rely on it it's it's and and then and then now it's war and you see how human beings are destroying not just each other through war but also nature itself like there's so many different you know shots will cut to like the bird um, whose wings, you know, got shot in the mm-hmm. battle and it's just dying. And, you know, that's not a person, but he's trying to show, you know, nature is adversely affected. And and I wanted to read one quote. Hold on real quick. Um, oh, yeah, I think this this one might be from the beginning. It's, and I don't remember which character reads it. It's this great evil. Where does it come from? How did it steal into the world? What seed, what root did it grow from? Who's doing this? Who's killing us? robbing us of life and light, mocking us with the sight of what we might have known? Does our ruin benefit the earth? Does it help the grass to grow, the sun to shine? Is this darkness in you too? So there's, I mean, just in that quote alone, there's so much. Oh, I forgot the ending. Have you passed through this night? It's just, it's so poetic and I think it's beautiful. And I, but it's, it's awful because it's about, or it's about an awful thing, which in this, case is war and it's sort of pottering this question are we evolutionary like programmed to go to war is it like in our mm-hmm. dna or is it this social thing where we're, we form cliques and dislike others and we fight i mean because war's been around as far as humans have since i've concerned there's mm-hmm. as far as i know we've always been fighting and he's just you know what is this root uh is it inherent in all of nature is it and us, you know, because other animals kill each other, but well, actually, ants do go to war. 
<laughs> so I can't say that we're the only ones, but I mean, you you get what I'm trying to say. It, it's this whole he's this he's questioning nature. Nature's being is not such a pretentious way to say it, but <laughs> no. But I see exactly what you're saying, and and it like even I think apes or, or greater apes will fight over territory, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it it's it begs the question, like you said, why do we have this need that we see societally play off, like play out rather on a large scale? I think one of the yeah. one of the characters says we're fighting over real estate. Is this yeah, just- no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was about to say that. One of the characters Maybe it's one of them. One of them gets shot, and they're like, "They're like, we're fucking fighting over property, yeah. you know." And think about that. That's ridiculous. You're killing because, and then you also have the general, you know, the one that's trying to send them up the hill, mm-hmm. no matter if they're going to die or not. You have him. He sees nature as this inherently evil thing that, like, you can't get away from it. So therefore, I need to complete my mission to advance myself. And then you have the other commander who's like, I'm not sending my men in to death to die because he sees he sees this more spiritual, you know, I I guess like they have as if his men have souls where the other guy just sees it as where the other lieutenant is kind of like, I need to accomplish this mission. Nature's inherently evil. I know people are going to die and I'm just going to be okay with it. Whereas the other so the other captain's like he's kind of the one that is like, you know, this isn't okay. And he's you know, the viewers also like this isn't okay. You know? You mm-hmm. kind of start getting that sense. Um But uh yeah, yeah. It uh it reminds me at least I'm looking at the actor's name, Nick Nolte, that whole plot line reminds me of a Kubrick movie by the name of Paths of Glory. And I'm not sure... I was going to say that. I was going to uh, talk about that movie, actually, when we were discussing this. Yeah, because it reminded me of Paths of Glory, too. It's huge parallels um, there where you're... It's, yeah. Um, you put the person who needs it the most in a situation to, I guess, do the impossible... I guess that that's probably the worst way to put it. I'm sure you can kind of clean up what I'm trying to say, but this person's drive and motivation, they've been overlooked. They haven't been able to reach the station in life they want to be. And they're given this opportunity that is almost calculated to be something that most people wouldn't go through to do it because they would be the person to do what is necessary as far as loss in sending people to their deaths to accomplish it. Yeah. And you think, you know, maybe this guy's just so seasoned that he's seen it all and that he's basically desensitized at this point, Mm. the commander to where he's just, and, and and the parallel is is in um you know in Paz of Glory when that guy's when they're all basically like do not send the men in, and then this guy's like we're send we're fucking sending them in you know even though it's a death mission, same thing here you know um super parallel, but you know why is he doing it you know um and you think well you know in, in a practical sense probably because if he didn't he could get fired or punished by his superiors. But at the same time, you know, when these characters are brought, and I think Malik wants, really wants to get this, um, this kind of thing into the film, but it's hard to show through film. It's this uh, concept from uh, Heidegger, the philosopher I mentioned earlier, who um, Malik, actually, or Malik actually translated one of his essays. He was very, very into Heidegger. Um, and Heidegger has this concept called being unto death. So he, he calls everyone um, human beings. He says, well, we want to investigate human beings because they are the type of animals that can question being itself. And you see, and, and Malik shows that throughout all this movie, you know, and the, you know, all these quotes about, you know, 
what well, how it's how is it going to be like for me to die you know and and all these soldiers start having these sort of existential crises as they get sent into battle um and i think malik really wanted to show those sorts of you know when 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 death is finally in your face how do how do different people react because part of uh Heiger's overall philosophy is that we sort of we all know we're all temporal we all know we're gonna die but we kind of push that thinking of death we we kind of uh, like push it underneath all these other things that we do in our daily life you know like when i like today when i was driving here when i was um eating when i yesterday when i went to the zoo i wasn't thinking about when i'm gonna die you know Mm -hmm. but now in this scenario these soldiers are faced with death and there's a lot of um there's just a lot of that what i would call being on to death type of um conversations that these soldiers have and um it's it's that is very interesting to me like there's a couple points you know there's one side believes you know there's an afterlife and then i think it's sean penn's character i forget who says you know this is the oh he says uh you know this is basically it we're on this rock or something like that and we're not we're not leaving um and there's only you know there's only one earth and there's only you know you're only one person and this is it mm-hmm. it's something along those lines um and and it's just this it, these conversations this dialogue i think is what malik wants people to take away and if you want a story that tries to answer those questions and i'm i'm just going to use saving private raven as an example and it's not saving private raven is not a bad movie but it has this stint to it that this movie i would say is very opposed to which is extremely patriotic american good germans bad you know japanese bad stuff like that and you know in this film for example when they win the battle it doesn't feel like anybody won you know what i mean it's just awful the whole thing's horrible it's just like that to me is just pure evil when we say what evil is that's what it is that was one of the most shocking parts of the movie is like <laughs> how terribly suffering the japanese soldiers are when they take, you know, their their base, for lack of a better term. Um, uh-huh. Because of, like you said, most movies present it as, like, this grand victory where you can celebrate. But, you know, to, to kind of reiterate what you said, it seems like such a shallow victory that it's like, look at the chaos that you created, look at the obliteration of this group that you did and that that's your victory essentially right right and how's that you know and you think about veterans and i and i think about talking to veterans or seeing interviews with them and you know 20 30 years down the line they're usually not incredibly ecstatic to tell their stories of victory because they so many of them have ptsd because I, I, I believe they probably feel like the guys in this movie are shown to feel, you know, they conquered the hill. Okay. Now there's dead children, women, men everywhere, blood and guts everywhere. Uh, you just saw like tons of people get killed. You just saw probably your friends get killed in mm-hmm. your squadron. Like there's no winner. And, and I think that's a good point he makes about war is, is that it's over property and no one wins and and when the soldiers arrive there you know i think they start to realize that and i think that's why they start to question their meaning so much and they start to question you know what's going to happen after i die you know and i think it's wit whose um mom died and he's like am i do you remember that part he said am i going to go calmly like her so that's another another <laughs> Heideggerian thing about being in the in the face of death as I said most of us are anxious we have angst if we start thinking about death you know and when we're gonna die 
And and in that moment when he was standing by in front of those Schultz soldiers and he knew he was going to get killed, he was calm. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a very important part of the movie that a lot of um, a lot of people might not uh, get on the first time over seeing it. But but if you uh, it, I mean if you have a if you've read some philosophy or some postmodern philosophy and, and you kind of get the concepts and you and you watch the film, that's something that that will come to you is that is that he believes that that calmness in the face of death is essentially immortality because you have no it's it's very hard to explain but um you're truly you're truly alive in that moment yeah exactly yeah that yeah that's the best way to say it probably yeah um and and in, in a way i know he was, or I know Malik was, uh, grew up a Christian, but I think he struggles with this faith a lot, and I think that's shown in this in this movie especially. Yeah, I mean, it. There's so many. You can look at this film, and and if you focus on just different threads, I feel like you can come out of this and learn something new after, and you could watch it multiple multiple times and probably get something out of it um and you know one of the things that you said it's like war that there's two sides and you could kind of toss and turn between either side but it's you're either the afflicted or you're inflicting um and neither side really feels like a victory um You know, because the atrocities are either happening to you or your friends or you're committing them on the people on the other side of the the field or the battlefield. Um, Yeah. um, Actually, one of my, I think maybe my favorite part of the film is when there's the, the face of the Japanese soldier in the dirt and he has his own voiceover to the American soldier, and he says, are, are you righteous, kind? Does your confidence lie in this? Are you loved by all? Know that I was, too. Do you imagine your suffering will be any less because you loved goodness and truth? So see, or Malik, or Malik is, is, is pointing out that <laughs> it's so weird just to say, we're all the same, you know, all humans are the same. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that's the cliche way of him of what he's saying. He's, he's saying that, you know, I believed in goodness and truth in my country and the way I was raised. Mm-hmm. Do you think your goodness and truth is somehow better than mine and and it's going to lead you, specifically you, to some place that I'm not now, you know, in this afterlife? It, or it, if there's an afterlife at all, it's this... He just constantly throws these philosophical questions and debates and it's into this war movie, <laughs> which... Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it it fits so perfectly, I think. Th- this is one of my favorite movies from him. The, uh, yeah. But, uh. Yeah, I want to make a, a quick point that kind of it draws from the relevancy of what you just said. I mean, there is, I think it's called a Hall of Warriors in Japan. And it is for, I. it might not be as specific it could be all soldiers but i believe it's for specifically kamikaze pilots because mm-hmm. what they were doing in their culture for their country was the highest honor in that you are literally giving over your life for a greater cause and seeing that on the opposite side because matthew and i were both american you know, we were on the opposite side of that war, but you get a sense of this is their perspective. They saw their soldiers as being larger than life. They were the good guys, too, in their country. The Germans didn't set out this whole schema because they wanted to be the bad guys. Um, you can obviously argue the holes in their logic and what they were trying to accomplish right but in Uh their minds 
what they thought or what they were doing they thought was right. You know, the the bad guy is always the enemy. You very rarely set out to do things just for evil's sake or to be the bad guy. And in that voiceover that you just talked about, it brings up that notion that it's like we are the same. We are different sides of the same coin. We're the same. But I was born here and you were born there. Yeah, and, and it begs the question, what are we doing here killing each other, you know? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and, I, yeah, and that, I think that's his whole, his whole point of the film. And, and, and it's so interesting that this gets released in the sa- a few months after, I think, probably the most famous war movie of all time, I think, Saving Private Rabbit probably is, mm-hmm. is released. Huge hit, you know. People still... You know that's like a movie people still cite, like they do Top Gun and and all that and all and like Black Hawk Down or all the, all those movies. Um, and then no one really paid attention to this movie because I can imagine audiences. Oh, they're like, oh, a war movie. You know, mm-hmm. they're probably going to be bored. Bored shows. <laughs> you know, because there's action scenes, there's war scenes, but they're all they're all what's the word. They all have this uh, film over them of, of not like literal film, but like this this you know like paper mache over them of of these of a, it being a philosophical movie instead of it being this hung like go war movie like mm-hmm. like a platoon like a platoon too. Um, as uh, an as another classic, uh, just just war movie, but. Um, it's just so much more a, a meditation on um, existence. Um, why are we doing this? Who we are? And I think a lot. I think he throws in there too. It's about if you're no matter how great of the soldier you are, if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, it's over. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it, if the bomb just so happens to hit you as you're charging the field, that it it's just random a lot of the times. So it's, you know, it's like all these soldiers are just, they're thrown into this place un- unwillingly with the draft. Um, yeah. But, you know, not all of them unwillingly. But, but and then they finally arrive. I mean, I can picture myself thinking about nothing except death if I got thrown into a situation like that too, you know? Like, I would be thinking, oh, I could get killed any day, you know, what, am I going to live after I die? Am I, am I going to be calm in the face? You know, so it, he, he gets, it's kind of like in Badlands where he really gets into the internal minds kind of of the entire group. Um, and they're di- along with their different little perspectives about nature, just like he gets into the mind of the, of the characters in, in Badlands. Um, and that's something that, you know, I kind of wanted to, to pitch your way, which and, – and there's probably better characters to choose from, but these are just kind of three that came to mind. But you have what uh, – to me, it seems like we get this complete arc that allows him the, the peace of mind at the very end because – he had almost dropped his arms, became non-threatening to the tribe. Then oh. he is in the face of battle, has to, you know, basically push forward the assault, which leads to, you know, catastrophic injuries and death for the Japanese. And he, I think he revisits that tribe or a different tribe, but they're very close in proximity, and they just want absolutely nothing to do with him. And it's as though his 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 aura had changed by being a part of this, and he he wants to set out to, in a way, kind of correct for what he had done. So he quite literally sacrifices himself to make amends. It was like 
he to see it go full circle and for him to make that sacrifice is what allows him to kind of die with a clean conscience and for him to yeah. f- you know feel as though he's not dying a villain for lack of a better term and then yeah no yeah i like that that perspective yeah then we have pen and we have john c riley and they john c riley has kind of become numb to everything whereas sean penn very much still feels very connected to all of this all of the atrocities going on around him and i just kind of wanted to get your perspective on it and how they're all kind of at very different stations of of their progression through this in the war a kind of coming yeah. to terms with it. Yeah, I mean, you got, and I can't remember which actor said which, but you got this battle, this, not literal battle, but you got this this dialogue, kind of philosophical dialogue going between a couple different characters. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if it's Sean Penn or the other actor... It's like a a debate between, you know, is nature inherently evil and is there some sort of grace of God in in a way to put it? Like, he he says at one point, in this world, a man himself is nothing and there ain't no world but this one. And I think that's one of the best quotes from the movie because I think that's getting one of the sides of the perspective that Malik wants to show put forth and that's there's no afterlife this is all there is and that's the existentialist um, which is a philosophy movement that heidegger and all these guys that that malik studied heavily was a part of and that's that um essentially we're thrown into a meaningless world and we have are we have to find meaning in that world and if you've ever if you're familiar with the story of the of the myth of sisyphus Hmm. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Okay. Um, it's, it's just this story about, you know, how we're thrown into this world and we're content and, and Sisyphus is this, I don't know if it's a, if it's Greek, um, or if it's Egyptian, but he's a God that, um, was deemed, uh, in the myth to always be pushing this rock up a hill infinitely. He never finishes. And so Hmm. in a way that that's like, us in, in the sense that we are always doing projects and mm-hmm. we don't really have a final point and in in this way and and the whole yeah sorry it might seem like this is scattered thoughts but connecting those all together um you know that point of view he's saying you know all you got is this world man like that's it you got your you got to do what you can with what you're given and then the other guy says, like, no top or something. I've seen a different world, you know. And, and and he talks about, you know, the beauty in nature that he's seen and that and that kind of just that human nature can be, can live in harmony. And, and it's such a, I, that, that's kind of a, a weird way to say it, but yeah, it's, it's this, I mean, here's a good example. Like, you see the crocodile at the beginning Mm -hmm. and then later you see the crocodile in captivity Mm -hmm. of the soldiers. So in a, in a way he's trying to show, Hey, humans are pretty much the worst predators on earth. And, you know, we, we we destroy things. We're bad for the planet, um, in terms of nature. Um, and so what he's saying and that, you know, this is the only world we got, it's contradictory in the sense that they're, I mean, he's not the leader, but they're destroying nature. And at the same time, you know, they're, they're saying this is all we have, which is, you know, a weird, you know, perspective to have because, you know, if you've seen where those world or those world war one trench battles happened or, in France, uh, if you've ever seen uh, that area of France, it's 
like completely destroyed and it's just mounds um for example like nature gets completely obliterated after war and and the other side i guess is that there is you know this life after uh this this scenario that we're in this death that we're in that's why he says i've seen another world and i think in a sense he's referring to the original a wall um you know his original a wall character that was living in harmony with the people the locals um i think that's what he means when he says i've seen a different world you know that we can't that, that nature doesn't have to be inherently evil but that's my take. Um, so that's kind of like the, I think a lot of the the battle that kind of goes, that's really the war that's going on, um, in this movie. I think it, it, it that's my interpretation. No, I I think kind of trying like to bring together the two huge points you made, um, and going back to the the Greek myth, I believe, it's like. Our lives are filled with distractions from our lack of immortality. And in doing so, we often become disconnected from the very things that are kind of, that bring life, you know? Yes, yes. We become more disconnected from nature itself, which we don't realize we're instinctively a part of. Um, I mean, uh, for example, I'm going to bring back Heider again, but he has this essay called essay concerning, uh, technology. And it's about how now we Germans look more, cause he's German would look more at the Rhine river as a source of electricity instead of a beautiful, you know, so something, a beautiful natural resource. Maybe they could get water from it, but it could also be like a beautiful painting. People aren't seeing the beauty in nature. They're seeing it the resource, you know, the deforestations of huge rainforests, for example. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, it's intensely prevalent. And yeah, I, I like the, the look, I think there's so much that you could really go through as far as technology, completely disconnecting us from everything around us, you know, Oh yeah, that's a whole other debate too. Yeah, and this is, and it's where you know this is totally pre-technology, mm -hmm. or not pre-technology. I what, mean, nineties. It's, it's pre big. Yeah. It's pre you know dot com big computer boom. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it it's this weird like people don't appreciate nature um, in the way they did before, and it's and you know you could say that 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 war is like the ultimate kind of depiction of our unappreciation because if you think about how people used to go to war they used to line up you know they used to it was a very structured battle that actually had rules and then after world war one um going on into two it turned into this bomb the shit out of <laughs> everything they have and just destroy it you know just obliterate everything burn the books burn all you know get rid of it all it, it, it's like it didn't exist and and that's like the destruction of like uh, ourselves you know in a way and, and and human beings it's i don't know it's a it's a very it, it's, it's so interesting to me i i i really super appreciated this movie I thought it was awesome, and after talking about it, I think there's so much that could be unpacked on a second viewing. Um, I watched this one first, and then Badlands, and I yeah, I asked, you would be let down then. I could see why you might be because I I like Thin Red Line a lot more, even though it might just be like half a star. I love Thin Red Line way more than Badlands. I I, I loved. Thin red line as well. Actually, I, I gave I gave this one four and a half, um, and I was I was pretty borderline on giving it five stars, honestly. Um, but and and I think contextualizing it with you could on a rewatch very easily make it 
five stars just because there's a lot of stuff that I didn't fully flesh out, but there was so much stuff that I was able to like really pick up on first viewing that yeah. made it just such an amazing movie to watch. What did you rate it? And what are your final thoughts on this movie? I gave this one, this was one of those easy tens for me or easy five out of fives for me. Um, I was blown away after I watched, after I watched this, I actually started days of heaven, which is the one in between these two that I don't believe you've seen. And then I turned it off cause I was with my girlfriend. She's like, this is boring. <laughs> and then, uh, I watched it later on my own. I was like, okay, no, this is amazing. Um, and then I watched Thin red line. I was like, this is even better. Um, but yeah, um, incredible movie. Um, I guess just what I want to leave it on is I want to read another quote because like I said at the opening, I believe this movie is like um, poetry on film. So that's why I think Malik Malik can be so diversive because a lot of people won't get a poem or it just won't resonate with them, you know, and it's just subjective. You don't have to like it. And it's the same way with this movie. I think it resonates with some and not with others. And I think it resonated so much with me a lot because of my background in philosophy. But um, I just wanted to leave, or I just wanted to say one more quote from the movie um, that just really always sticks with me. And it's, what difference do you think you can make? One single man in all this madness? If you die, it's going to be for nothing. There's not some other world out there where everything's going to be okay. There's just this world, just this rock. I, I mean, like, there's so many lines like that where I'm just, you know, I'm it just brings me back to my undergrad philosophy days. And it also, uh, it just makes you, I just say, it leaves you with so much questions that I just want to keep talking about the movie, but I know we're, we're coming to the end here. Oh, and I didn't even mention the fact that this film is freaking beautiful and it's cinematography. I mean, one of the best shots I think I've ever seen is when they're walking up the hill, that grass, how it mm. moves. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it I mean, almost the, seems it's like it's dancing with the wind. Yeah, and the nature shots, like the, the, the different nature shots throughout, the different animals. I mean, God, I, I, I just love this movie so much. Um, I would recommend this movie. Uh, out, of, out of all the ones we reviewed, I'd, I'd want someone to watch this one the most. Yeah, this was a masterpiece for sure. And I'm glad I got to watch it. And I'm even more glad that I got to talk it over with you. Because again, seeing Malik through your lens and with the, like, just the knowledge of of how Phyllis, or philosophy played such a huge role in his films adds a greater understanding to it. And I'm really glad that I got to to talk to you about this, man. This was this was a really good episode and every yeah. time I talk with with you and basically everyone, I feel like I take away so much more from the conversation and like that's an awesome thing about getting to talk about these films. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I love yeah, I've loved all the discussions we have. This one's probably just been my favorite because I got to bring in my philosophy knowledge. And uh, my friends will know when I'm around them. If we get into a philosophy talk, it's hard to get me to stop. So <laughs> I had to I had to try and control myself. And I'm like, okay, Matthew, are you, are you ranting? Are you getting off topic here? <laughs> you know, because I wanted to talk about all the different, you know, aspects of <laughs> of Heidegger's work and how that, you know, came into the film. But that would take hours and it would be fruitless because it's very hard to grasp his philosophy. And it's also, you know, it's not all pertinent to the movie, but yeah, this has been a great episode. Probably my favorite we've done so far. So. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you liked the video. If you did be sure to drop a like, subscribe, comment your thoughts on these movies, Malik as a whole, and also be sure to check out Matthew's letterbox page because um, he watches a ton of movies. He has great takes, as you can tell. I mean, if you've listened, he always brings a different perspective. And I think after 
getting to kind of look through your lens whenever I read your stuff, Matthew, it increases my appreciation, you know, whether I've watched it before or am planning on watching it. So I highly oh, recommend uh, thanks, it. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. So that's all we have today, folks. We will catch you on the flippity floop. Bye, y'all.